Um, if you've got your Bible, turn over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Um, and uh, we're going to cover a, uh, a really an interesting chapter. It's, uh, um, it, it's a chapter that... Uh, i got to get my glasses out too. Um, a chapter that covers a lot of ministry, and, and I like this. Um, as you know, the, the book of Timothy is a letter that Paul writes to a young pastor, a young pastor who uh, is pastoring the church there in Ephesus, a church that uh, Paul had helped set up through his missionary journeys, a church that Paul loved, a church that had problems. Um, if you find a church that does not have problems, uh, please let me know. Um, but I can't join it because then I would present a problem probably there. And so, um, but, but that church had problems. It had problems with unity. Uh, in the letter that Paul wrote specifically to Ephesus uh, and to the church there, he talked about being unified. He talked about um, making sure that they were all together. Uh, they uh, were a church that uh, had some issues as far as love. They had forsaken the first love that they were supposed to have. And, uh, and I believe that that was the love for God and the way they loved others. Uh, when Jesus um, addressed the church in Revelation, he told them that. He said, you've forsaken your first love. He said, remember the height from which you fall and repent and return, or I'm going to take, God said, the lampstand, which was the church. God said, I'm going to take the church from you. Well, then we got this letter that uh, Paul is writing to this young pastor. Now, I uh, don't know exactly how old Timothy would have been at this time, but we know uh, that he would have certainly been a contemporary of Paul. He would have been somebody that, uh, if, if he wasn't saved under Paul's ministry, he was certainly uh, probably heavily influenced by Paul's ministry. And, and uh, Paul trusted him enough to send him to the people that he loved there in Ephesus. And so... As he's ministering, and as this letter goes, we, we've seen so many things. We've seen uh, an addressing of false teachings that take place, and that was rampant in churches and, and is still today. Um, I, I sat and, and watched some things today with uh, just some, some various things that are going on right now, uh, even in the midst of our convention. And uh, I just, it was concerning, extremely concerning to me on a lot of, lot of levels, and and uh, but they you know, they, they were struggling in those areas, and he encouraged Timothy on how to handle those things. Uh, he talked about church polity. He talked about uh, you know the leadership inside the churches. We've looked at uh, deacons, dikaios to serve, and and what that meant. We've looked at um, presbyteros uh, and what that meant as far as with bishops and elders and all of these type things as they come together and ministers. Um, and, and tonight, what we're going to look at is, is a couple of things. We're going to look at, well, about three different things, three or four different things, okay? We're going to talk about how we love each other. We're going to talk about the ministry of the church to widows. Very interesting as we sit and talk about this, okay? We're going to talk about the ministry of the church to its ministers, all right, and I'm just going to tell you what God's Word says through this, okay? And then the last part of that is what I would say is probably Paul's ministry of encouragement to Timothy. Um, Paul was not always a, an encouraging person, especially I don't think that anybody prior to the road to Damascus would have ever said, Paul is an encouraging guy. But with, with people like Barnabas in his life, with people uh, that poured into his life, Paul became an encourager, and he encourages Timothy at the end of this chapter in, in some kind of neat way. So um, there's an old, old saying that goes like this. People won't, know how, uh, won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I had to learn this, um, sometimes the hard way in, in ministry. I've, you know, 25 years and and I was sitting back, and I was talking to Hunter um, a couple of days ago. We, we were getting ready for one of our podcasts that we were doing. And by the way, if you, uh, if you have a smartphone or even a computer and want to listen to uh, our podcast, we, Hunter and I do a podcast that put, is put out on Mondays every week. It's called the Calling in the Wilderness podcast. You can find it on, uh, if you've got an Apple phone, just go to your podcast. You can find it. You can find it on uh, iTunes, you can find it on Google, you can find it on Alexa, huh? 
Spotify, you can find it on Spotify. So all of those areas, I don't know how it gets to all those places because Hunter does it, but it, it's called The Calling of the Wilderness, and uh, we put one out every single week. And, uh, but we were, we were getting ready for one the other day, and we were just talking about, about the changes that God has done in my life in, in the last 25 years. And quite honestly, in the, in the 10 years that I've been here as your pastor, um, I've mellowed a lot. Uh, some of it comes with getting old uh, or older, I guess. But, uh, but some of it has also come in, in just my, in a very, uh, very strong change that I've had in my leadership and, and how, uh, how I lead in, in those type of things. And God, several years ago, really uh, convicted me in a lot of areas with, with the way I led and, and the way I was leading. And um, what birthed from that was Jethro's Challenge, where I, where I wrote the, the book on leadership from uh, Exodus 18. But God did a, a work in my life. And the thing, that, the thing that I encouraged Hunter with was this. I said, don't ever let things get ahead of people. I said, don't ever let the, the things that you're doing in your life, and they're important, but I said, don't let them get ahead of just loving people and ministering to people and, and being there for people. And, um, you know, I, I served with a pastor one time, and I promise you this. I mean this with all my heart. I was the youth pastor. I had to, to ask my secretary, our secretary, to make an appointment for me to be able to go and talk to my pastor who was three doors down from me. Um, it was just, that was the strangest situation I've ever seen in my life. And that's why I always say it's best to have an open door policy. And I tell people all the time, if that, if that old gray Dodge Ram is out there, I'm in here, come on. You're, you know, because people are, are that important. Well, this chapter points out that people are vital. People are vital in ministry. And so I just want to start and we'll just kind of walk through it and, uh, and, and we'll, 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 we'll get there, I promise. We, we've got about uh, 37 minutes to get there, okay? The first thing we have in the first two verses is this. Love others like they are your immediate family. And I want to, I want to read it because this is, this is kind, of, kind of interesting. It says, and this is one and two, it says, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers. Treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. I have, I've taught this ver these verses before and I've, I've utilized them in, in various sermons. And the thing that I've always kind of really really looked at the most was this idea of don't rebuke them, don't talk harshly to them, don't that, all of this. But it never really just kind of hit my heart until I was studying it over the last couple of weeks. And I said, you know, in every one of these, what, God, uh, what Paul was saying through the inspiration of the Lord to Timothy was this, love people like you love your immediate family. And I got to thinking about that in my life. And, and you know the love that I have for, uh, for, for my, my wife. You know the love that I have for uh, those two girls. One of my girls is home right now. The other one is in the middle of 70-mile-per-hour winds right now in Auburn. Um, if, if her power goes out, I'll leave straight from here and drive and go get her probably. So, but you know the love that I have for them. You know uh, the, and the love that you have for your family, the love that you have for your parents the love that you have for, you, for your children and for your grandchildren. Well, these verses right here, they, it's not just saying don't, don't be harsh to, to people. It, it's not just saying don't this and this. It is literally saying you are to love people like they are your immediate family. And, and, and I sat back in my office and I sat and I thought and I thought and I thought and I, there's been a lot of times in my ministry that I didn't love people like I do my family. And, and it was convicting of me, and, and, and that was part of what spawned um, Hunter and I being able to talk and me encouraging him to 
you know, to make sure that people are vital in your ministry. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's something that we grow, and we definitely grow in, in, in different things. But this, these verses say, love others like you love. And I didn't just say your family. I said your immediate family. It says like they're your father, like they're your mother, like, they're, like they are people that, that you would do anything in the world for. And I got to thinking about that. There was absolutely nothing that I would not do for Beth, Megan, and Abby. Nothing. All the way down to giving my life in a second, I would do that for them. And this passage of Scripture says that you and I... Now, understand, he is writing a letter to a pastor, and that is a pastor's love for, for his people. But that same love filters down to every one of us. That's loving people the way that God has called us to love them. So love others like they're your immediate family. And then, it's, then it says this, verse 3. Uh, and, and I'm just going to read the verse and then we're going to hit it, okay? Verse 3 says this, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. And I just put that as my second point. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. And then as I went through this, and as you look at this, there are some things there that are very interesting. There are some things there that talks about ministry to widows, that it talks about the church's responsibility and the family's responsibility and the widow's responsibility. And it all kind of comes together in this. It was very interesting. But, but here's the thing. Verses 3 and 4, and then you get on down to verse 8, remind us that the first responsibility for the care of widows is on their family. And look what it says there. Uh, it, it says in verse 3 and 4, and then we'll skip over to verse 8. It says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. In verse 8, it says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially their own ha household has denied the faith and is worse, it says, than an unbeliever. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty strong terminology, you know, when it talks there. There's three reasons that those verses give us, that, that a family should care for the widows that are inside their family. And the first thing it said is this, and this is uh, the first part of verse 4. It says, put your religion in practice. In other words, we, we understand that God's word teaches us, just like we saw in the first two verses, that we're to love each other with, an, with a, the love of God, that we're to, we're to take that love and we're to care for each other and we're to love each other and we're to do all of these things. And the early church especially, and you're, you're going to hear more about this this Sunday in the, in the sermon, but the early church was, uh, was a, a ministry where they, they met the needs of each other, they took care of each other. And it says this, it says, you need to put your religion into practice when it's needed the most inside your families. And so it says there, the first reason is to put your religion in practice. But the second reason, the next part of verse 4, it says, because they took care of you. I, I, I love this part. Uh, he says there, um, uh, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, uh, they should first learn to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family. And this is what it says. And so repaying their parents and grandparents. Well, praise the Lord. I have one of my daughters, my oldest one, who uh, wants to be a geriatric nurse. And she wants to actually do hospice nursing. And I told her, I said, that is, that is great. And uh, then I've got Abby, okay? And, and uh, I don't think she's watching right now, but I asked Abby one time, I said, you know, when, when I get old and, and, and I need you to take care of me, uh, you know, what are you going to do? And her exact words were, well, isn't that what Megan's going to school for? And I said, yes. And this is what she said. She said, well, I'm going to make enough money that I can help pay for you to be there. I said, well, thank you, baby. I, I guess that works, but... Well, I did. Mom, <laughs> Mom, that's not fair, but I will tell them. One time, Mom, Mom, Mom said this. She said, you know, and I was kidding with her, but I said, 
Uh, she said, if, if something ever happens to me and my mind goes or something like that, she said, you know, it, it's okay to put, you, put me in a home. And I said, no. I said, there's no way that I would do that for you. I would, I would take you into my house. And she looked at me and she said, would you really do that? And I said, yeah, I'd put you in the basement. I'll throw you some water down there every once in a while. She didn't find that funny, not one bit. I did say it, though, didn't I? She didn't find that funny. So, uh, so anyway, I needed to read this chapter a, a little bit better. But the truth is, moms and dads took care of us. You know, I think about the things that Beth and I did for our girls. And, uh, you know, the truth is, sometimes life takes a full circle. And everything that we did for our kids, eventually, it's quite possible they're going to have to do those things for us. And this passage of Scripture, it kind of says that families need to do these things. Uh, but, the, but the last thing, and you see it in the last part of verse 4, and then you can look over at verse 8, it pleases God. It says in, the, in that uh, verse of Scripture, uh, it says, For this is pleasing to God. Then you get over into that eighth verse where it simply says, uh, you know, for those who are not providing for their relatives like they should, it, it says that uh, they've denied the faith, and it's worse than being an unbeliever. Now, I pondered that because, Brother Joe, I had to ask myself the question, what in the world is worse than being an unbeliever? Well, apparently not taking care of your family like you're supposed to because that's what God says. But I think what they're saying is it is vitally important. And, and so the first responsibility is actually on the families. The second thing is interesting, verses 5 through 7, and then we'll skip over to 9 through 10. A widow must have and maintain their spiritual growth. Look at verses 5 through 7, and then, then we'll jump down to 9 through 10. It says, the widow who is really in need and left all alone, it says, put her, puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Skip down to verses 9 and 10. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good, need, good deeds. Well, you sit and read that, and you think, well, what, what is they saying? And, and just to pull it down, basically is this. A widow also has the responsibility to maintain and continue their, their level of spiritual growth that they're doing. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough at times. Uh, it really is. Um, the loneliness that, that, that you feel. And, uh, you know, when I, I call and I, I talk with various people, and, and, I, and you'll hear it in their voice. You'll just hear, you know, the loneliness and, and the walls as they cave in. And, and some of you know exactly you know, what I'm talking about. But, you know, it's so important. It's so important that you maintain and continue that level of spiritual growth. And, and that's what these verses are talking about. It's talking about, you know, that you're doing those things um, that bring God glory. And, and you're glorifying God uh, through your life. And so a, a widow must have and maintain their, their spiritual growth. Uh, and then the, the verses 11 through 15 are the instructions to younger widows, and this is very interesting, and we're going to hear about this, okay? But let's read verses 11 uh, down, through, uh, down through 15. It says, As for younger widows, don't put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they have broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and uh, going about from house to house. And not only uh, do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I, I counsel, it says, younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Well, I'm going to be honest, that's tough. That's tough words there. 
You know, it, it, first of all, it says that uh, you don't put anybody on the widow's list if they're, uh, if they're younger than 60. It's already it said that in there, okay, and, and you, can, you can ask whether that's practical, how you do that. And we're going to see in a minute that there certainly is a ministry that the church has with widows. But, but these instructions to younger widows are very interesting. The first thing he said was, be careful not to exchange love for passion. I've seen this. I've seen this on a number of occasions, especially with, with young people who, who have lost their spouse or, or, or different things like this. Is it becomes easy to exchange love and what it's supposed to be for some type of passion. And he says that in these verses. He says uh, in, in verse 11 down through uh, 13, he says, As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. And then it says this, For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they've broken their first pledge. Besides, and then it says all these, it says they get into the habit of being idle, going uh, about from house to house, and not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things uh, that they ought not to. Now, let me, let me just kind of explain this. That does not say that if you're a young widow that you're going to be sensually driven and you're going to be a busybody and you're going to be a gossip and you're, it's not what it's saying. What it is saying is this, if you're not careful, you can fall into some of these traps. If you're not careful, if you're not doing what it was in the, the first few verses there, if you're not spiritually growing, if you're not spiritually maintaining your walk with Christ, if you're not doing these things, if you take your eyes off of what is supposed to be going on in your life and you put them onto the things of this world, it's very, 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 very easy to fall into a major trap and i and i and i read it and my first thoughts are well those are pretty harsh words but then i sit back and think about some ministry and things that i've done through the years and i can tell you beyond a doubt that there are many examples where the things that we find in these verses take place and it's because we've taken our eyes off god and and it's kind of heartbreaking so be careful not to exchange love for passion. Uh, but the next thing in verses 14 and 15, it says prayerfully and biblically try to press on in life. And, and that's what it says there. It says, so I counsel younger widows to marry. Have children, manage your homes, and give the enemy no opportunity for slander. And it says in verse 15, some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. Basically what, what Paul is saying and what he's encouraging Timothy with is this. Look, we encourage the young widows to not let their life stop. To continue in their life and to, to continue in what God has for them and to continue obviously to grow spiritually but also to continue uh, in life and to be able to press on. One of the hardest things that you can ever say to someone who has lost a loved one like that is to press on. I've done that. I've ministered to people, and it's very hard. It is extremely hard. And what I always say is this, God never says let go, but he does say continue to press on. And there, there's a major difference in those. And so I told you when, when I was reading through this, and I've, and I've studied this book a number of times, but uh, when I was reading some things about the ministry to, to widows and things here, uh, you know, it caused me to sit back and, and really think. And it thought, I thought about ministry. Uh, and, and Brother Joe, you've probably had situations. You, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and I guess unless you've just been there and seen these things happen, uh, it's for real. It, it is real. And if you don't have your, your focus set on what it needs to be. And by the way, you can take the widow side out of this. If you and I and your walks do not have the focus where they're supposed to be on Christ, you too, scripturally, can fall into all kinds of trouble. So uh, I think it's very wise counsel. It's certainly wise counsel for young widows, but I think it's wise counsel for every one of us, okay? Well, then you get down to verse 16. And this is it. The church must fill in any gaps that a widow has. Let's read verse 16, then I want to chat about it. It says, If any woman who is a believer has widows in her care... 
She should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. Now you're thinking, well, that right there says that the church should not be burdened with the ministry to widows. Be cautious. It does not say that. It says that if a widow does not have family who is taking care of them and the proper means to be taken care of and the proper needs, both spiritually, physically, all of these things, then the church must step in and fill those gaps. It's one of the greatest ministries that we have. It really is. And where, where if you're not careful, you'll read verse 16 and think that it's, uh, that it's kind of limiting the ministry that a church ought to have to widows. I want you to know, first of all, that doesn't fit the totality of what Scripture teaches us. And so don't take one verse and pull it out because I can take you to a number of verses that also talk extensively about this. But what, what I drew my heart into was this idea that it says the church is there to minister to those who are in the greatest of needs. And we do that. I don't brag on our deacon body quite enough, but I love those guys. Um, we had our first deacons meeting this past Sunday since February. We didn't even remember what deacons meetings were all about. We, uh, we got in there, and we forgot how to do it and all that. I mean, it, but it was a good time. But you know one of the things that I love about our deacons is the ministry that they've always tried to have to, to widows. And, you know, it was not an overbearing type thing, but it's a great ministry. And, and the thing that's done my heart good is when I sit in, in our deacons' meetings and we're sharing together and I hear from them, just the heart and passion that they have for loving and, and taking care of people and serving. Um, the word dekainos literally means to serve. And I'm telling you, these men that God has placed in leadership, uh, servant leadership here at First Baptist Church of Moody, and some of you are in here right now, and you guys are some of the greatest men that I have ever served with. And I don't just say that. I'm telling you. In 25 years, you guys are some of the greatest men that I've ever had the privilege to serve with, and, and, and I love it. The church must step up and minister to those who are in the greatest of needs. Now, does that mean that the church doesn't love on and minister to people who already, to widows who already have families that are loving on them and already have the means? Absolutely not. Uh, but it, what it does mean is that we don't, we, we don't have to focus the attention on making sure that they're fed or making sure that they're making it to the doctors when they're supposed to or making sure that they're medicine. You see what I'm saying? There's a ministry that the families are able to do so that the churches can pick up and love the widows and, and watch them spiritually grow and nurture them and care for them spiritually and, and lift them up. And, and it's an incredible ministry, uh, you know, when, when you're able to do that. Well, um, the, let's get to this last uh, part because we shift gears, okay? He started out talking about how we love others as family. Then he spends the next uh, verse 3 down through 16 talking about the church's ministry to its widows. And now let's look at the church's ministry to its ministers. And, and I want to read it, and then I want us to, to just kind of just kind of talk about it, okay? This is what it says. This is uh, verses 17 down through 20. It says, The elders who would direct the affairs of the church... Uh, the elders who direct the, fair, the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading uh, out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, 
It says, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. All right. Well, there are several things that this passage of Scripture says that a church has as a responsibility in caring for its ministers. And I'm not just saying this because I sit up here as your pastor. Uh, but I do want to talk about what this passage of Scripture says. And the first thing it says in verses 17 and 18, it says that a minister is, worth, is worthy of double honor. Well, I got to thinking about this, okay? Okay. First of all, the, the word double honor, it's, it's the Greek word duplos, which means double. And it's the word time. Now, I'm just going to tell you what it says, and then I want to I go to it, okay? Time is actually the Greek word that you would have for the price. And so what this verse of Scripture says is that a minister is worth double its price. That's how the Greek language says this. Now, now, I'm, what it does not say is that a minister should get paid double what they do. That's not what this says. And believe it or not, I read some things where some people use that verse in such a way. But what it means is this. It means that, that most people, and Brother Joe, you can, you can probably say amen to this. And David, you can say amen to this. Those that are in the ministry, you don't, most people do not know everything that takes place in the life of a minister. There are things, you know, I, I've, I've, I've had people have said to me things like, you know, what is there to do for you during the week? And I always chuckle, and what I always say is, would you like to spend a week with me? I want to just give you just a basic of, of what my days generally entail. And this is, and COVID has been different for that, but, but, Listen, my phone, my mom can, sitting here can witness to this, okay? If I ever go to mom and dad's house for dinner, my phone's going to go off, how many, 10, 10, 12 times? I start getting phone calls and text messages at 6 o'clock in the morning just about every day of the week. I received my last text message last night at 1124. I read it. Uh, I wasn't awake for it, and I didn't respond it, but I did receive it. Okay, it happens we, we, all the time. We get called out. Um, I've spent a number of times where, uh, where we leave early and we come home late. Um, we, we go to, to minister to people, and people don't even realize they don't even understand it. Can I tell you what COVID has brought? Um, because I had somebody mention to me, they said, well, it should be easier on you because you're not having to visit hospitals. Well, let me go ahead and explain what I have been doing. COVID has been horrible for young families, apparently. And it breaks my heart, but it has been. And I have spent an incredible amount of time in ministry, um, ministering to people, ministering to families, crying with families, um, you know, pleading, whatever you want to talk about. Those type things take place. I spend a lot of time studying uh, for sermons, okay? And right now we're preaching, preach two sermons a week. Um, generally more than that. Sometimes I'm teaching in various places, but just for a general notice, I'm, teach, I'm preaching two sermons a week. I promise you there is no less than 15 to 20 probably hours put into every sermon that I teach, that Brother Joel teaches. We've spent two or three weeks that we've been working on these type things. And so all I'm saying is this. Please understand that their ministers do an incredible amount, incredible amount that a lot of people don't see and a lot of people don't, don't understand. Um, Dad and I, I can't tell you how many times Dad and I are out fishing or we're driving in the car, and I'll see, because uh, uh, my phone's messages or my phone rings through my car, and I will look at Dad and I will say, all right, Dad, plug your ears. It happens all the time, and I have to, and I have to you know, pick my phone up and talk and, and, and things like this. I sit in a boat a lot of times with a phone stuck to my head, um, and it's just one of those things. And so when I say that a minister is worth probably double what, um, what they get paid, um, I believe that, and I don't say that for myself, but I, can, I look at Hunter, I look at Michaela, I look at all my other pastor friends, I look at, through, I'm going to tell you something, folks, I look at Brent Fincham, these guys, they, they, 
you'll never know uh, the ministry uh, that, that goes on there. Um, but, but why? Why is a minister worth or worthy of double honor or double the price? Well, he gives two reasons here. First thing he says is, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading grain. In other words, the minister should be free to minister. Can I ask you to do something for me? And, and this hasn't happened in a long time, but it has happened. And Brother Joe, you've had it happen to you too, I guarantee you. If I'm coming in for worship and I'm about to preach, please don't stop me to tell me how mad you are at somebody else. Or stop me to tell me how somebody just offended you. In your, your Listen, I, it's not that I don't care about those things, but I don't want to walk up in the pulpit with thoughts going through my brain of everybody that has all, all these difficulties. I love, and listen, this is exact, this exact thing has happened. There's times when I've been walking through the back, and, and, and somebody will say to me, Preacher, I need to have a word with you. And I always, my, you know, I don't say it, but my brain is going, could it wait till after church? But the answer to that is generally no. And so, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading the grain. In other words, you got to give your ministers the freedom to minister. Whether it's, whether it's me, whether it's Hunter, whether it's in the church, whatever church you're a part of, ministers have to be given the freedom to minister. One of the hardest things that I've ever seen uh, in churches, and praise God, you guys don't do this, but it's when a church takes their, their arms and wraps them around a minister and not to love them, but to hold on to them and to guard everything that they do. I talked to a pastor not long, not long ago who told me that his church made him, he has to log his hours and give it to the leadership in his church every week. And he said, have you ever had to do that? And I said, not only have I, have it, have I not had to do that, I said, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but, and and it's, it's not because I'm arrogant in that. It's just, my goodness, you know, you don't need people that are just on top of him. And he was sitting there bawling his eyes out, and I was ministering to, you know, to him. And he was saying, does your church not do that to you? And it's bad, but I, I hated to say to him, no, they don't. You know, they give me a freedom to, to minister in those type things. But the second thing uh, it says is um, that the work deserves his wages. The word uh, deserves literally means, it is the word axios, and it literally means earns. Uh, it means that a minister literally earns his wages, and I don't want to. I don't want to belabor this, you know, because I, I don't. But I just want you to understand what God's word says. And verse nineteen says, "Be slow to accuse." I just want to read it. Okay. Verse nineteen says this. It says, "Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses." One of the things that I've always told our staff and was told to me when I was a youth pastor was this. You can't help what somebody says about you, but you sure can make sure it's false. And that's what I, 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 I you know, I sat with, with Hunter and, and uh, not long ago, and we was talking about just things. He, he just loves to he loves to ask questions because he's brand new at all of this. And, and uh, you know, he, he will say, what do you do when people are, uh, are, are, you know, bringing negative things or saying false things about you or whatever else? And, and I took him to Acts 6 and 7 with Stephen. And remember when Stephen was called uh, to wait on tables and to minister. And then uh, through that, God expanded his ministry. And he was, he was doing such good for the gospel that the people began to bring accusations against him and false accusations accusations against him, but they could not stand, it says, against the wisdom and the spirit by which he lived his life. In other words, they could say all these things, but they were false. There's nothing you can do about, you know, what people say about you, but you definitely can make sure uh, that it's false. But be slow to accuse. But, but then verse 20 says this, if reproof is needed, then do so. And there is a huge contrast between verse 19 and verse 20. 
Because verse 19 says, be very cautious if you're going to go and make an accusation against a minister. But then verse 20 says, but if there is reason to do so, it not only says do it, it says do it quickly and do it publicly. Look at verse 20 again. It's tough. It says, but those elders who are sinning, you are to, pr- uh, to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. And so I guess what I'm saying is this. There, we as ministers are not above reproach uh, or, or, or above, we should be above reproach. We are not um, above being reprimanded and those type things. And there's all kinds of areas that that happens. Moral failures. If I ever preach something that is contrary to God's word, listen, do it biblically. Come and let's talk about it. But if it's an area that needs to be brought for the church, then, then that's what God's word says. Why? Because I am held accountable to what happens in the ministry. Believe it or not, I'm not just, I'm not as... Scared's not the word. Yes, it is. I'm not as scared of the accountability that I have to have to you guys in the ministry as I am the accountability that I have to give an account for before God. And that's huge. Scripture says that I will, Brother Joe, we will be held of greater accountability for what we have done with what God has called us to do. I don't take it lightly. But if reproof is needed, verse 20 says, do it. All right, let's get to this last part. We've got about four minutes to do it. 21 through 25 is Paul's instructions to Timothy. Let's read it, and then, uh, and then we'll close out with it, okay? It says, I charge you in the sight of God in Christ Jesus uh, and the elect angels uh, to keep these instructions without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because uh, because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious. Even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. All right, well, there's several things that, uh, that Paul says to Timothy. The first thing he says is this, minister fully and fairly. He says in there, do not, uh, you can go back to, uh, to verse 21. Uh, he says in verse 21, he says, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the... By the way, how cool is this next part? Don't overlook this little part. He says, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels. I want to know what that means. We're not given anything more than that. I just think that's really cool, okay? Folks, there is so much that goes on in the spiritual realm that I don't think we even know, you know? You remember in, uh, what was it? First Kings 6, please don't hold me to that. I think it's First Kings 6. When um, um, Elijah and his servant, Elisha, one of the, I think it's Elisha and his servant are out, and the king of Aram, it, his army is coming because Elisha has been sharing with the Israelites everything that king, king of Aram was going to do, and it's making him mad. And the king of Aram is, is going to his people and saying, who is backstabbing me and they said it's nobody it's Elisha and he 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 knows everything you're doing and he's telling the Israelites and so King Aram sends his army out in the middle of the night and they're in camp and it's just Elisha and his servant and they're camped by themselves and the king of Aram at night surrounds them and Elisha comes out that morning and 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 well actually his servant comes out then he goes into Elisha and he says Elisha they have surrounded us and Elisha gets up and he looks around and he says two incredible things to his servant he says do you not see that there are more that are with us than are against us well the servant probably looked at him and went huh and then Elijah prayed this prayer he said he prayed a prayer and he says Lord open the eyes of my servant that he can see you. And it says, as he did, he looked and realized that they were surrounded by angels sitting on chariots of fire. I wonder if Elisha stood up and said, come on. I don't know. That's free. Okay, 
That has nothing to do with this, except for this angel part. But I think it's a cool story, okay? Um, but but um, it says there to minister fully and fairly. Um, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ and elect angels. Keep these instructions. It says, without partiality and do nothing out of favoritism. Let me tell you what, what this is. I, and, and I think there's a lot of ministers, um, and I try not to do this, okay, but they give favoritism to those who they think can help them the most. Um, they give favoritism to people who uh, maybe could give the most uh, and, and those type things. And, um, you know, and, and that's what it says, minister fully and fairly. Uh, verse 22, practice discernment. Um, do not be hasty, it says, in laying on hands, and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. This is kind of interesting. Do not be hasty in laying on of hands. Um, one thought in this, and the thought that I kind of put with this, is that that is in, in, in ordaining or in giving your blessing to someone else in the ministry. In other words, it says don't just be hasty about that. Um, you know, just because, Brother Joe, have you ever had somebody come in and say, well, the Lord's given me a word to, to speak today. I ha you have, and I have too. I've had somebody come up and they, uh, I had a visitor come, not here, but at another church I was pastoring. A visitor come in, walk up to me and says, look, I, I was driving by and the Lord just told me that I needed to come in and preach today. <laughs> not lying. And I looked at him and I said, well, here's the interesting thing. The Lord also told me that I was going to be preaching today and I don't think the Lord is confused so you're not preaching, you know, and, and that was one of those times when I was less um, kind probably than I should have. But my goodness, um, you know, but practice discernment. Um, all right, the, the, the next one, verse 23, take care of yourself physically. I want to read it because I, you're going to, I'm going to have to tell you why we're getting to there. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. Well, did God just, I mean, did Paul just tell Timothy to go and drink? Yes, he did. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Let me tell you some interesting things I find in this. First of all, Paul had to tell Timothy to do this. Second of all, he had to tell him to do it for physical reasons. Third of all, the drink and the wine that Paul said for Timothy to use is not compared to what we have today. I hear people try to tell me all the time, and you know me, I am a teetotaler, and here's why. I do not believe that God's word demands abstinence from alcohol, but I do believe that God's word gives incredible warning against it. Biblically, there is a word, it's called shikara, and the word shikara is... is defined in Scripture and translated in Scripture as strong drink. You'll find it a lot of places. Um, and what they would do in those days is they would take the fermentation of a, of a grape in the water and then they would put additives to it. They would, they would put additives to it to strengthen the fermentation process. They would put additives to it to do all of these things. Sound familiar? A lot like what we do today. And, and they even said this, um, I think it was Yale University did a study, and it would take 20 glasses of biblical wine to equal one glass of what you would find in the store today, okay? So, we're not comparing apples and oranges. And can I go ahead and give you one more tidbit, and then we'll get back to this? That word shikara, which in Scripture is, is used for strong drink, universally in God's Word, it's condemned. So, I'm not going to tell you uh, it, it, that uh, one of the things they had to use, the reason they, they drank fermented water uh, in those days was because their water was loaded with bacteria, and that was a way of killing it. And most likely, he was drinking the water, which was causing his stomach to have all these problems. And so, uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, look, put some fermentation in that to kill off these bacteria. But it's always been interesting to me that he had to be told to do that, which means he wasn't doing it before, and I like that part. Um, that's free. If you want to talk about whether it's biblical to drink, we'll talk another time, okay? Number four, and we close with this. Ooh, I've got to hurry through it. Be transparent. 
24 and 25. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. The, the thing that, that I see in those verses and Paul's encouragement to Timothy is very simple. Be transparent. Be, love God in such a way that you don't have to go and tell everybody that you love God. It is so evident in your life. Uh, it's a good chapter. It's a long chapter. A lot of information there. Anybody got any questions or anything? Anything surprising in the chapter for you? Okay. Yep. I'm a teetotaler, and I go back to another thing that Paul said. Paul said this, all things uh, are permissible, but he said not all things are beneficial. And then he restated it in a little different way. He says all things are permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. And, and I've always put that. And the other thing is, oh, nothing that should cross my mouth that could cause a brother to stumble. And so I have taken the Nazarite vow, basically, except for I do cut my hair. Well, Jesus cuts this part, but... Um, but as far as it goes with, with drinking alcohol, I've taken a Nazarite vow. Listen, I will not throw a stone at anybody uh, for, for the things that they choose. And, and, and maybe one day I'll preach a sermon on what, what I see from, you know, a biblical uh, stance on, on drinking and things like that. But I just want you to know where I stand on that. So, Anybody else? I don't know if I tell you often enough how much I love you, but I do. Um, I really do. Uh, we sit and... Pray, pray for you by name. Um, I, I look across here, and there's not a single one of you that I haven't prayed for by name. And uh, I love you. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to minister together. And uh, I'm just thankful that, that we, get to, we get to share this time together. I really am.